The definitive small British people's car is, of course, the Mini. But the Hillman Imp, one of its closest rivals, on paper at least, is more exciting. Rear wheel drive, rear engine like a Porsche 911, with an all alloy lightweight engine that was derived from racing. Not to mention these days, it's a more left field unusual choice. So is the Hillman Imp the thinking man's mini? Well, let's take this one for a drive, courtesy of Drive Dad's car here in Matlock Bath, and find out. But first, our friends at Lancaster Insurance are running monthly giveaways. You can win all sorts, from experience days to tools, restaurant vouchers and tech. So click the link below at the end of the video to enter their latest competition. The Suez Canal crisis had actually proved a bit of a blessing in disguise for the car industry. It was a disaster politically and economically of course, but it gave us some of history's greatest small cars that were charming, fun to drive and hugely economical of course. The Mini had proved that Britain was into the idea of a tiny, economical car and Roots Group decided that they wanted a challenger to that. Two employees within Roots, Mike Parks and Tim Fry, offered to design what had become known as Project Apex, the Roots challenger to the Mini. The initial design was rejected by management for looking too much like the infamous bubble cars of the early 1950s. So they went away and had another crack at it, embracing utility but wearing that on its sleeve and doing so stylishly. And the result, the car that would ultimately be coined the Hillman Imp, I think was a triumph. From some angles it's even got essences of Americana about it, some lovely curves, gorgeous chrome work, little mini fins at the back and art deco style tail lights. This is a gorgeous little thing that's got a real charm and character to it. Controversially, I think it looks way better than a Mini does, but don't tell Jeff. And in some ways, the Imp would be more advanced than the Mini as well. Looking at cars like the Fiat 500 and the VW Beetle that had their engine in the back to kind of leave all the noise and pollution behind and give the front wheels more space to turn for a tighter turning circle, the Imp 2 would be rear-engined. Coventry Climax were approached and asked for an all-alloy overhead cam engine that sported a full single mesh gearbox in an aluminium transaxle to go in the back of this car. Now that was a huge demand as an all-round engineering feat and yet Coventry Climax pulled it off. They bored out one of their race engines to 875cc, changed the internals to make it more appropriate for road use and they'd done it. They created a race-derived all-alloy engine that could go into a small family runaround. A miracle of engineering it might have been then, but by the time the Imp actually hit the market in 1963, rear wheel drive in a small car was a bit outdated. The Mini was front wheel drive, the Renault 4 was front wheel drive, and there were an increasing number of transverse engine cars coming onto the market. So for all the clever engineering, on the face of it, the Imp already was a bit out of date. Roots had plans for massive expansion to build this car because they had visions of it being a number one seller. But Roots simply didn't have the money of BMC or Ford to go and build a new factory. So they took a government grant, which would supply them with a nice boost. The condition of that grant was that it would provide employment to an area that was struggling. And that meant the new car would be built in Linwood in Scotland. Unfortunately, that was over 300 miles away from Root's main plan, and that meant that most of the management and people who could oversee the whole engineering development and final construction of the new imp would be nowhere near it, and as a result, not really inclined to go and oversee things. There's more. The delayed release of the Imp, while they'd been getting the government grant through and then building this all new factory, meant they were keen to get going and start building the new Imp and get it on the road. That meant that the final development and testing was canned, and that meant testing things like the auto choke and developments on the cooling system. Not small things to simply gloss over. What's more, a press leak in 1962 meant the Imp didn't even get the grand unveiling that Roots were hoping for it. Nonetheless, Roots pushed on, and in 1963 the Hillman Imp was formally revealed to an adoring public of journalists. The journos who drove these cars loved their charming looks, their fun drive, their practicality and remarkable fuel economy. But were they right? Around 60 years on, what's the Imp actually like to drive? Is it as good as a Mini? Immediately, it feels different to a Mini. Because you've got all the weight at the back, the front is lighter and dartier, and the steering feels fantastic. This car is so light on its feet, but unlike the Mini, it's got that swing from the rear effect that you get from old rear wheel drive cars. It's remarkably light on its feet, this thing, and gives you so much confidence to chuck it around. The massive steering wheel in this car just isn't needed, frankly. 
and it's so flingable. There's hardly any body roll. The ride is a little bit bouncy, if I'm honest, but I'd still say it was more comfy than a Mini. I'd definitely be bounced out of my seat more if I was driving BMC's little car around here rather than Roots. Pulling it into a corner, it just sticks. And then there's that little engine. Put your foot down. It's a sweetie. It's turbine smooth, makes a lovely little rumble. And it's surprisingly torquey as well. You'd imagine with such a tiny capacity that you'd have to rev the nuts of it to get it moving. But actually, it does get up and go rather willingly. A lot of rear engine cars, you find yourself fishing around to get the next gear. And this is a very tight gate, but easy. Every single time I've gone for a gear and I've got the one I've asked for. Third gear down there, little heel and toe. Pulling it in, oh, it just grips. Sorry, this camera kept flying around in the back, but I'm having too much fun to care. Just fling it in here. Oh, it's great, this thing. It's eager. It's all the good bits of a Mini, but in many ways, even better. Just a little bit rattly, that's all. And if you're a family man, rather than a wannabe racing driver, the Imp was practical too. It had a spacious cabin, this neatly laid out dash that was just subtly more stylish and a bit more interesting to look at than the simple Mini one. It had quarter lights, had wind up and down windows, which of course early Minis couldn't offer. Loads of legroom in the back, and because of course the engine is in the back of the Imp, you're not going to get a boot back there either. So you do have a little storage boot in the front where the wheels are, and the rear glass opens up. So you've got a little shelf behind the back seat. Don't mistake it for a hatchback, because technically it isn't. It is just a hinged rear window. But it's surprisingly practical for such a tiny car with the engine where most people at this stage were putting their luggage. So the Imp showed great promise there, but unfortunately, it wasn't to be. Building it in a factory with staff that had never built a car before, let alone doing it with a water-cooled, all-alloy, rear-mounted engine, meant that the imp's reliability was far from perfect. Water pumps would fail and the engines would dramatically overheat, which with a fragile, soft alloy head and block meant engines, when they overheated, were pretty much scrap. They also suffered from carburetor and automatic choke issues that meant they would overfuel, they would fail to hot start, fail to cold start, and run incredibly lumpily. While the Mini, despite some of its flaws, wouldn't. Yes, they did improve the reliability later down the road and sorted out those cooling issues. But by that point, the damage to the Imp's reputation was already done. Not to mention that by the mid 60s, the Suez crisis was over and really, we didn't need tiny, hyper-efficient cars anymore. We were back to having bigger engine family saloons. So the one market that might have bought it despite its flaws was pretty much gone. But Roots weren't about to let the Imp fail and they desperately tried to salvage something from it. They introduced a coupe, a van and an estate car variant and there were posh Sunbeam and Singer variants introduced to rival the likes of Vanden Plas and the posher Minis. But in truth it barely made a difference and Roots Group were floundering across the board. Chrysler's gradual takeover of Roots between 1964 and 67 saw the company thrown a lifeline and the Imp did soldier on until 1976. But by that point hardly any one was buying them. You have to feel sorry for the Imp, really. It was a brilliant little car with loads of thought put into its design and its engineering to be the best little car it could be to rival the Mini and take the world by storm. But ultimately it failed due to circumstances beyond its own control. The very same thing we'd be saying about countless British Leyland efforts in the 70s and the 80s. Overall, Roots sold 440,000 Imps, which sounds all right until you realize that that's less than 10% of the total number of Minis shipped. Not to mention the Mini sold on for another 25 years after the Imp had been killed off. But don't let those few little setbacks put you off the Imp. Because this remains a fantastic little car. It's great fun to chuck around. It's surprisingly practical. It's hugely economical. It looks great and it puts a massive smile on your face. And when you see the prices of its arch rival rocketing like they are and how affordably you can still get into one of these, I'd say yeah. The Hillman Imp really is the thinking man's mini. Chuck it in here, oh yes. Woohoo! This video is proudly sponsored by Lancaster Insurance. Give them a call on 01480 400 889 for an insurance quote on your classic car. And don't forget to click the link below to enter their latest competition.